comes on um, because we're having a few issues and I don't want to run too late. Um, but yeah, uh, hi. <laughs> Thank you so much everyone for um, watching this, uh, for signing up. Um, and thank you so much to the amazing speakers that we have lined up today. I know that you're all incredibly busy and it's a very heavy time. And so I really appreciate you making the time to do this and to share your insights because they're just gonna be so incredibly valuable, particularly in this moment, I think. Um, so uh, my name's Kelsey. I'm part of a group called Community Action on Prison Expansion. Um, and we're running this uh, session online uh, in conjunction with uh, No More Exclusions. Um, we're both abolitionist organizations and we're gonna be talking a little bit more about what that means. Um, I guess I wanna acknowledge like in this moment, a lot of, uh, a lot of people are hearing in the mainstream and all over their social media, um, words like abolition and defund and dismantle, and they might not be super familiar with those things. And at the same time, realizing that they are struggling with their own sort of complicity in parts of the pain and the struggle that people of color and black people have been facing for a very long time. And I really appreciate if any of those people are the people who tuned in today, because this is hopefully an opportunity to take some of that new energy. Um, you might be feeling some shame, some guilt, some discomfort um, from these last few days or weeks um, with the conversations that have been happening. And, I hope that this is a place where you can take some of that energy and hopefully put it forward into some work. Um, but I also want, I also know that many of us right now are feeling rage and grief and pain and frustration. And for a lot of us, that's not new. Um, this is something that comes from decades and centuries of trauma, of oppression, and at the same time of organizing and struggle and a legacy that we follow within that. I want to raise and acknowledge the work of the United Families and Friends campaign who march every year in October to remember the people who have died in police and state custody. Um, and I want to, um, sorry. Um, and I want to acknowledge that work that is done all the time and not just in these moments um, where there is public energy for it um, and people who are impacted, many of us who are impacted by these things on a daily basis. Um, but some of the people that the United Families and Friends campaign march for, um, I think it's important to say some of those names um, some of those people, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but some of the people that have been particularly on our minds um, right now have been, the ones that we've been hearing a lot in the media from the US particularly have been uh, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, but the United Families and Friends campaign over here in this country are remembering and many of us are also remembering Sarah Reed, Natasha Chin, Annabella Landsberg, Mark Duggan, Sean Rigg, Rashan Charles, Roger Sylvester, Joy Gardner, Cynthia Jarrett, and many, many more. I think it's important for us to, to say those names and to hold that many of us are still grieving as well as in this moment while many of us are learning. And I wanna, I think it's also important for us to acknowledge that racism in this country manifests in so many different ways and our people are impacted in so many different ways that are sometimes not as obvious. Um, and many people organize to try and make those links. Um, 
And I think it's important to remember that there are these moments of trauma that have impacted huge communities. Uh, the things that we've been through after 10 years of austerity and seeing the decimation of our public health services and our support services, um, which we have seen numerous reports over and over and over again that show that it is disproportionately black and brown people who are impacted by all of those choices that are made. Um, to remember in 2017, the Grenfell tragedy, to remember the Windrush scandal in 2018, and that the last few months with the COVID-19 pandemic that our communities have been being hit harder and have been treated with the utter most disdain by the people in power during this time. And so that we are carrying a lot with us in this moment. But we are also following a legacy of work that has been ongoing and has seen wins and has seen progress. And we are living a future that many people only ever dreamed of. And so we have to hold that as well and acknowledge that we continue to move forward. Um, a little bit about what racism looks like in the UK right now. Um, I have some stats to, to add in terms of what policing looks like um, right now in the UK. Um, we have, we know that stop and search um, by the police impacts black people around nine times more uh, than white people. We know that black people are also three times as likely to be arrested um, and five times more likely to have force used against them. Um, in the UK, in, in, in England and Wales, the population of people of colour, um, black and brown people, is only around 10% of the population, but we represent about a quarter, 25% of the prison population. And black populations in the UK only make up about two or 3%, but represent about 14% of the prison population. Um, and when it comes to young offenders institutions, so uh, prisons for children, uh, we know that black and brown children are in prison. They make, about up, up, make up about 50% of those institutions. Um, I also, before we start, I really want to acknowledge that all of the work that informs me and my knowledge um, has all of this work that has come before me, I really want to sort of list um, and name the work and the legacy that we follow. Um, basically none of the information that I have really comes from me. You know, all of this is thought that has been mostly black feminist work that has been being done for a really long time and anti-racist work. Um, and so I really want to acknowledge um, and some of this is work that is also going on right now. And so I will also acknowledge some of the successes that have been had. Um, but I really wanna hold up the work of Mariam Carver and Survived and Punished in the US, fighting for people who find themselves criminalized for defending themselves against their abusers. Um, the legacy of critical resistance and insight, um, Angela Davis, Ruthie Gilmore, people who have written extensively and organized for decades to lay the path that we follow. When it comes to transformative justice, I think of creative interventions of the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective of Generation Five and of the analysis that has really helped us understand the depths of how violence works uh, and is used against black and brown communities uh, Beth Ritchie, um, IWOC, people who are fighting every day to support people who are in prison, who are impacted by policing. Um, we have the California Coalition of Women Prisoners and the Sister Warriors campaign. We have, like I said, the IWOC chapters across the US. Um, and I have so many. Um, 
so much of this work is is being done um and yet at the same time so much of this work is like deeply neglected and so it's incredible i you know i want to acknowledge just how many and recognize the organizers and how incredible they are for having done so much with so little capacity while often struggling themselves against intersecting oppressions um and closer to home or internationally as well we have Olive, Olive Morris, uh, the work of Claudia Jones, uh, Walter Rodney has taught me a lot, um, and also Sisters Uncut. Um, and so I really want to acknowledge those names. There will be many other groups I'm sure referenced over this talk, and we will be uh, releasing sort of a, a list of resources for everyone to kind of look through and, and, and do some research if you're not familiar with some of these names. Um, so now uh, I'm going to uh, introduce our panel. Um, so we have, I mean, this is where it's getting a little bit more tricky. Um, but uh, uh, Chelsea Jackson is very, <laughs> um, very kindly joining us um, from Oxford. Uh, Chelsea is an abolitionist and a black scholar um, from uh, Georgia in the US um, and is uh, engaging in research at Oxford University. Um, and has been involved in Black Lives Matter organizing over in the US and is now getting involved in organizing over here and will be sharing some insights into organizing over in the US and the sort of historical context um, of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, we also have Angelica. Um, who is just a brilliant organizer and abolitionist and anti-racist educator and just a brilliant mind who is going to be sharing with us uh, some of the context here because I think many of us are not necessarily uh, very aware of the history of British policing and prisons um, and the imperial aspects of that as well. So I'm really excited to have Angelica here. Um, Zara, Zara, are you able to turn on your video? I think I'll go to Lola next. Um, very excited to have Lola um, also speaking today. Uh, Lola, also another just brilliant mind, brilliant organizer, um, and recently released a book called Feminism Interrupted, which is just incredible. Um, and uh, just very excited to hear what you have to share around abolition perspectives on feminism um, and inter inter interpersonal violence um, and the ways that abolition relates to those things. Um, so thank you again, Lola. Oh yeah, we have Zara now. So and we have Zara, thank you so much from No More Exclusions, um, a brilliant organization. Zara um, describes herself as a recovering teacher, activist and co-founder of No More Exclusions, which is an abolitionist coalition that's uh, calling for um, abolition, it's an abolitionist movement within education, fighting racism within our education system and our schools. Um, and so I'm really excited to have all of you here to um, join this discussion with me. Um, and thank you again for everyone for tuning in. And I think um, that is probably enough from me. Um, obviously this is an Abolition 101 um, seminar. So we are coming at this from an abolitionist perspective. And again, this is a time where many of us are questioning things. Many of the people watching this might not have considered or heard about these ideas very much before, but this is work that 
is not just about dismantling things, though it is very much about that. And it is not just about um, shining a spotlight on the oppression and the pain, but it is as all, but it, what it is is also about building something new and it is about hope and it is about thinking outside of the structures that currently exist and really thinking about what, did it, what is it that we can build that's new. I think a lot of us often think that we have to reform or we have to change the structures that we are in. And for many of us who know that these structures have never worked for us, um, there's been no choice but to, to think outside of that. And so I'm really excited to hear what some of you all have to think about this. Please also feel free to start putting your questions and comments in the chat box and also in the comments box on Facebook. Um, and someone will be filtering those through and sending them to me. So then after we've heard from all of our speakers, we can start to think about, we can start to answer some of your questions. Um, so we thought that we would start with Chelsea to introduce some of the, um, um, I thought we would introduce, uh, start with Chelsea to introduce kind of what's going on in this moment and the kind of historical context in the US. Um, so thank you so much, Chelsea. I'll kind of hand it over to you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, to everyone who's Black on this call, thank you for waking up today and opening your eyes. Um, that is a revolution. Act, and I appreciate that from you today. Um, my name is Chelsea Jackson. I'm from the fascist United States of America. Um, I was born there, but um, I hail from Decatur, from outside of Atlanta. And I just want to speak the name of the Chickasaw people because those are the lands that I was raised on. Um, I was raised on those people's lands and just want to clearly say that every time I speak Atlanta. Um, so my background quickly is I'm a political scientist by training, which means I look at systems, how systems work, how people are, uh, everything from elections to legislation to the organization. And particularly my research area is the intersections of crime, race, and politics. So in America, that's basically everything, but specifically to look at the criminal justice system. Um, in looking at the history of the American criminal justice system, there is no institution, but especially not a, a punitive one that is not based in chattel slavery and the basis of America as a colony of the United Kingdom intended to um, bear wealth, bear fruit for the, for the queen. So in, in recognizing that the first uh, police officers before there were ever police officers organized in any way were slave patrols, which were actually just armed white militiamen, much like the men who killed Ahmaud Arbery um, or Tamir, Tamir Rice, uh, a, a, a sort of self-empowered um, security guard of whiteness. Um, and, and that morphs the slave patrol, which role is these are people who don't own slaves. So they're not making money off of slavery but their role in maintaining Black enslaved people as uh, inferior, as unhuman, as property, reified their humanity in their own eyes as a maybe a yeoman farmer who doesn't own anything and is living on, you know, a cotton plantation, but at least I'm not the enslaved person. So when we move from slave patrols and into um, the resistance of Black people, every time we speak about Black death, I want to speak about Black resistance because often uh, we talk and mourn um, George Floyd, we mourn, mourn Tony McDade, we mourn Tamir Rice, we mourn Mike, Mike Brown, but we don't talk about the Ferguson uprising, right? Um, and, and in many ways, Black resistance stands um, in the history of America right up next to every single institution, which is why I say abolition is the politics of our ancestors. So to quickly trace that from Black 
anti-slavery abolitionists from Frederick Douglass to David Walker writing as early as 1830, who's calling out the clear contradictions in the American Declaration of Independence and making an open call to all black people across the world, not just in America, not just in the colonies, but in 1830, he writes this open call across the world to take up arms in defense of their brethren and who are enslaved and to overthrow this fake democracy, which is the United States of America. Now, to trace from 1830, going into the life of Frederick Douglass in the 1850s and 1860s, oh, that was David Walker, just to clarify that, um, colored uh, appeal to the colored peoples of the world. Um, so to move into the resistance on the plantation, the resistance of a slave rebellion, Nat Turner was an abolitionist. Nat Turner was a revolutionary. And Nat Turner was also called a murderer, a rioter, someone who incited violence, an insurrectionist, right? A an outside agitator, right? But Nat Turner was a pastor who understood that the reality of even the theology he was being taught on the plantation, the, the spirituality he was being given was filtered through anti-blackness and racism. And he looked to the Jesus who flipped the tables in, in, in the market and said, violent uprising, violent resistance to oppression, murder, rape, brutalization is not wrong. And that history and that legacy has been lost and, and sort of watered down in the post-civil rights movement. So quickly to move through the civil rights movement, and, and I know I'm jumping a little bit, but to get to the civil rights movement, it's important to understand that police, before they were police, once they became police, have never not killed Black people in America. They've never not brutalized Black people in America. And Black people in America have never not resisted violently, enthusiastically, in the streets, in protest, in all different forms. So we can look back to the 1920s where black men are being lynched after they're returning home from fighting in World War I and the NAACP uh, running silent marches through, through the streets of New York City, thousands and thousands of black people um, waving banners that say a man was lynched today, right? So the images that we're seeing today in over 350 American cities, where you see signs like stop killing us, I can't breathe, Black Lives Matter, these movements, this is not new. We're in 2020, in the 1920 Black people were doing this, and in 1820 Black people were doing this, and in 1720 Black people were doing this. So Harold Cruz in his book, Rebellion or Revolution, which I'll re recommend to folks. He talks about the historical discontinuity of many of our movements and many of our resist, much of our resistance against white supremacy, against capitalism, against dehumanizing people and extracting everything from them and treating them as disposable, which is what our prisons do, which is what our criminal justice system does, which is what an education system that trains our children to obey and not to imagine does. And so in the United States, when we have these structures set up that have been set up and have morphed since slavery, but have maintained, the first prisons in the United States were slave auctions. So it's not to say that every prison, every police department in the United States has an outgrowth of slavery because we understood that it wasn't present in all territories, but that the baseline of repression and control that comes from American policing comes from the idea that you cannot have people that you stole against their will, who you force to work and labor and toil, who you murder and exploit, to walk around freely without an armed guard to keep them in place. And that is the fact of the matter. When you establish land on, on a genocidal land. I, I would encourage people to just Google the history of the Texas Rangers. That's a genocide squad that was created to literally exterminate indigenous folk. So when we look at the history of these institutions, we have to understand 
policing and particularly American policing was designed to murder and kill, oppress, brutalize, sexually assault. And, and, and I'm sorry, I'm using very triggering language here and I, and I didn't uh, do, do a warning before this, but the reality is that Black Lives Matter has been the, on the breath, was on the, was on the breath of my great, great grandmother, Victoria, as she was beaten to death on a Jamaica slave plantation, uh, nearly to death before she was transported to Mississippi. They took her to Jamaica to break her first because she was too resistant. She had that abolitionist spirit that wouldn't allow her to sit still and take, well, at least I'm alive. No, I wanna be free. So finally to kind of transition um, out, I wanna move to, to a critique of sort of the celebrity culture and the black centrist and also the democratic sort of co-op, liberal co-optation that's going on. Um, as Kay mentioned, I wanna uh, raise the name of Elder Angela Davis. And I was reading, rereading her book, Abolition Democracy. Another great one, especially if you wanna learn about the trajectory of prison abolition to slavery abolition. This is a great book. Um, but in this book, she said that we can't be surprised when we're getting co-opted. We have to expect it. So we can't be surprised now that the mayor of DC has painted a huge Black Lives Matter in front of the White House. And yet she voted for $19 million to, to go to the DC police department for this just this fiscal year. We can't be surprised but the reality is Black Lives Matter is not about outrage about Black death. Black Lives Matter is about outrage and fight and resistance and fire and every tool, every arrow in our quiver for the freedom and justice and liberation of Black people. And the last thing I wanted to do is quickly read just three points from the Black Lives Matter website of what we believe. The reason I wanna read this is because it traces back to W.E.B. Du Bois's Pan-Africanism. It traces back to Marcus Garvey. It traces back to Malcolm X. It traces back to Kwame Ture, formerly known as um, Stokely Carmichael. And they say, we are unapolog unapologetically black in our positioning, black power. In affirming that black lives matter, we do not need to qualify our position. To love and desire freedom and justice for ourselves is a prerequisite for wanting the same for others. Black Lives Matter is not about putting cops in cages. Black Lives Matter is not about indicting cops. Black Lives Matter is not about getting cops fired. Black Lives Matter is about freedom and justice for Black people. And there is no justice in a cage. There is no justice in a, a statute book where every crime that's listed can only be committed by an individual against another individual. That's not a basis of justice. And so that's not what Black Lives Matter is about. The second point, we see ourselves as part of the global Black family, and we are aware of the different ways we are impacted or privileged as Black people who exist in different parts of the world. This line hits hard, so hard for me as a Black a, a woman who was born in America, who's currently in the UK. I now openly identify as an African woman whose ancestors were stolen. Um, but for me, wrestling with my nation being in a period of rebellion, of uprising, of my people, my comrades, literally right now, washing tear gas out of their eyes, and I'm sitting in Oxford. How can I wrestle with the privilege? How can I wrestle with this space? And the fact that I am a part of the global Black family and that folks here are screaming Black Lives Matter. And we know from Beli Muhinga, right, that Black women um, are not safe, just like Breonna Taylor wasn't safe, right? So the connections that we see, the, the legacy of resistance connects us, not the legacy of oppression. The history of white people oppressing us is not what unites black people in America, in the UK, across Europe, across the continent of Africa, across Caribbean and the Latin American nations. What unites us is a history of resistance. What unites us is imagining a world that is more, that is better, a freedom, a democracy, a justice that's not couched in individualism, but that really understands the, the, the spirit of Ubuntu, 
I am because we are. It takes a village to raise a child. We are all in this together. So in this moment, it's easy to remember the names, Tony McDade, George Floyd, to talk about the individuals. But I refuse to allow liberal media or sound bites or Twitter or trying to fit very complex ideas into short space of time to allow me to shrink black rebellion and black resistance into a few days of protest, into a few cities, into a few killings, into a few divine, um, into a few calls to di uh, divest, into a few calls to arrest a few officers, into a few calls to investigate a few departments. This is a collective problem. And we have collective solutions. So I think everyone, I don't want to keep talking, but I, I, I just love you so much, um, everyone on this call. And I'm so thankful for these freedom fighters at CAPE and, and No Exclusions who organized this space and, and just for allowing for me to be here in community with you all and build. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, I'm going to switch over to Angelica now um, and hand you the floor, I think. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, and thank you so much, um, Chelsea. Like, I actually feel a bit um, emotional after you said that. You're absolutely um, right uh, about your point, emphasizing resistance and making these connections um, because what's going on isn't just an American issue and we should really resist the liberal media's framing as this just being about George Floyd or just being about police violence and isolated police killing in the States. Um, because when we look at the history of um, prisons and policing, you can't detach it from empire and colonialism. And like Chelsea said, um, prisons policing were required to uphold the um, colonial and imperial regimes throughout Europe. But I'm gonna talk about Britain in particular because we are, we're in the UK and the thing about British violence and the word violence is really important because prisons and policing is a form of that's a form of violence required to control populations, groups of people that won't conform. So when Europe began to expand, the European um, empires began to expand, Britain began to expand, create colonies, plant colonies in Jamaica. And I'm gonna talk about Jamaica and the Caribbean um, a lot because Britain did have slaves. They weren't on the British, um, on British soil in the UK, but in Jamaica and other parts of the Caribbean, that was part of the British Empire and that was Britain at the time. So when we look at the history of the British police service, the British prison service, we have to think about the British Empire in its entirety. And um, often, in fact, these regimes required violence to sustain themselves, which is why prisons and police were required. So. Where should I start? Okay. For example, the first British prison is often considered to be um, Millbank, which was built in, I think, the mid 18th, mid 19th century. But the British actually experimented with um, a national prison service in Jamaica almost a century, half a century before. And till this day, three of Jamaica's adult prisons were founded by the British. And um, they were used to imprison and punish slaves that refused, um, that resisted, which it, like Chelsea said, is a legacy that we continue to see to this day. Um, often the police force, for example, in the Caribbean, oh, can everyone hear me? Let me see the chat. Yeah, I think it's working. Okay, people can hear me. Okay, good. Now, as I was saying, um, most Caribbean police forces um, were established in around the early in eight, uh, the 1840s, 
um, which is directly following the abolition of slavery, which was in 1833. This is the abolition of slavery in um, the British empires. Just because slavery ended, that wasn't the end of um, colonialism. So we see a direct, everyone talk, it's often, it's talked about how um, after slavery ended in the States, that was almost immediately replaced with um, mass incarceration um, and prison and slavery in another form. This applies to Britain as well, but it just, the difference is that Britain didn't have um, it on mainland Britain, it happened in the colonies in Jamaica. So a lot of these um, police forces were named the Imperial Police Force. In India as well, the Indian Police Force was originally called the Indian Imperial Force, the clue is in the name. And after decolonization, the only thing that really changed was the name. Um, most of um, the officers, the constables were, the, were trained in um, Britain, or if they were indigenous, indigenous part of the native population, they were often, for example, in the Caribbean, Caribbean police officers were often taken to a different island um, as a way of um, divide and rule. So as I was saying, the British Empire required force, violence, control, a real revolution, a revolutionization, a revolution in forms of control as a way of um, upholding empire, keeping slaves, um, controlling the population that they saw as useful for labor. And if that wasn't useful for them, they have to be put in cages. And I think looking at the imperial and colonial history of um, the prison and policing systems, um, is a really good way to expose how it's never been about keeping people safe. It's always been about upholding the status quo and upholding the interests of empire, um, controlling racialized people, disciplining racialized people. And you can see that the legacy of that today um, in how in the UK, Kelsey mentioned, made the point so well, dis it's disproportionately black and brown people um, who are in prison and working class people um, who are in prison. It's not really about justice, like Chelsea said, because if it were really about justice, the people, the institutions who have committed most of the crimes, who or most of the heinous things, most of the violent things in this world would be in prison, but it just doesn't happen. And um, making that connection um, between the British empire and the policing system and the prison system, which a lot of the former colonies have essentially just inherited um, is a way of stopping Britain from distancing itself from what's going on in the States, what's going on um, around the world. And prison abolition, it's a global fight. It's a global struggle. It's something that a lot of people in the global South and here, um, we all have a stake in. And I think it's a really, by acknowledging the history of the resistance, the history of the violence, the history of empire, it's a way of getting mo almost most of the world to say, hang on, where did these institutions come from? Where did this system come from? What was it originally intended to do? For, for example, most people don't know that concentration camps often attributed to um, uh, the Nazi regime in Germany were actually first used to suppress the Mama uprising in Kenya in 1952. Um, internment camps, new ways of controlling people um, were developed. And what's interesting is that around the time that prisons first started developing in um, the UK and in Europe, they were seen as um, a more humane and um, I guess enlightened way 
of dealing with crime. You know, there was this idea that it was welfareist and it was focusing on rehabilitation. Um, and it's only now in the last 50 to 100 years that things have become a lot more punitive and carceral. And that's often attributed to America. Oh, we've just been taking on what um, America's doing, when actually that's not the case. If we look at how um, violent and repressive policing and the prison system was in the colonies, you can see how violence, um, surveillance, humilia humiliation, degradation um, is just this history of like punishment and um, confinement is part of a long history of um, the British Empire. And often a lot of the British um, police officers and prison officers that were used in um, the state, in um, the colonies, it was based on um, the Irish model, the Irish paramilitary model, because Britain was obviously trying to control the Irish, um, I guess, independence movement. And that style of policing that they used in Ireland was a lot more militarized, which is why you see um, the like forces in the Britain's former colonies tend to be more militarized. And this, the, the distinction between the prison service, the police and the army isn't as clear. And that is a direct result of how um, the history of British suppression in Ireland was kind of exported to the colonies and how these technologies of confinement, these strategies of surveillance, punishment, discipline, control, um, traveled across Europe and the empires. And to we can't really separate what's going on in Britain from the States. And that's something that I've seen the British do a lot. I mean, I'm sure we've all seen the Metropolitan Police tweeting that they're in solidarity with George Floyd's family and how what's going on in America isn't okay. I mean, it's very British, this way of distancing the violence, outsourcing it, making it subtle, making it sophisticated. It's a very, very insidious technique that needs to be resisted at every front. You see it in the media. What's her name? Emily Maitlis from Newsnight. Had, they were talking about the protests that have been going on and shout out to everyone who's gone out today to protest in Hyde Park. The media is trying to frame this as an American issue when it's a global issue, it's a British issue, it's an imperial issue, and it's about violence. And that's something that needs to be hammered home. These institutions were only made necessary because the empire required force and violence to be up to be uphold and to be maintained. And I think I've talked for about 10 minutes now, I'm not sure. Um, and so if anyone has any questions, oh, someone's even said in the chat, someone's talking about Germany. Yeah, the German empire used concentration camps in what is now Namibia um, during the Herrera and Nama genocide, exactly. And it's interesting because a lot of what I'm literally moving from Britain to Germany, but it's it applies. A lot of what happened during um, the Holocaust in that era was literally a case of the empire coming home. All these European states were doing this to the blacks and browns, the darker skinned people in the colonies. And then it came here. And you can, by making that connection, you can really build solidarity with a lot of different groups, white working class people, impoverished people, queer people, sexual minorities, you'll see the people who are marginalized experience the blunt edge of state violence and hammering home that abolition is about taking violence seriously, saying that violent, meeting violence with violence isn't a way to solve violence, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and I think often people think, I mean, this is definitely gonna come up in the questions and I've, I have strayed a bit, but um, people think that the question that comes up a lot is, but what about the rapists? Like, what about the murderers? What about all the violent people? How are we going to deal with that? And by looking at um, the prison and the police force, okay, I'm gonna stop looking at the comments because you guys are really dropping some great points. Yeah, Britain didn't intervene in Hitler's regime. 
Yeah, you don't have to look at the after, don't worry. I'm gonna I'm gonna close the chat, but um thank you so much, Kelsey and Chelsea. Um I think that's enough for now. And yeah, I'll make my point. Uh thank you so much, Angelica and Chelsea. I think between you you've given us like so much context and insight into how this all works and the history um, behind it and given us some really some really powerful thoughts as well. I can see so many people saying thank you to both of you in the chat. Um, this is going great. Uh, I'm just gonna stop talking and move it on. I just wanted to say one thing, which is thank you so much for both bringing that anti-imperial lens to this and understanding that not only is it not just a US issue, <clears throat> but that it is a US issue that is connected to Britain, but that the British issue is connected globally. And that this is not something that we can, that we should just abolish in one place, but that we must be responsible for the way that we, um, that these countries and these states have influenced and harmed all of these different, um, yeah, these communities, these, uh, these people for centuries. I think also what's really interesting is we're starting to move into this question of kind of changing our frameworks, right? From the frameworks that are given to us, which are about crime and actually thinking about this framework, which is about violence and about harm. And I know that that is something that's really, really important when we start thinking about young people and the education system. And so I'm gonna start handing over to Zara so that we can hear a little bit about the reality and the work going on um, in relation to young people in the UK. Um, Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Angelica and Chelsea for the education today. And thank you everyone who's tuned in. Um, thank you to everyone who organized. Um, our thoughts go out to everyone in the UK, in the US, um, in every continent, South America and the Caribbean, Central America. Asia, Middle East, and the motherland, Africa, um, as well as in Australia, New Zealand as well. The anti-Blackness struggle is global and anti-Blackness racism is what we're here to center, is what uh, normal exclusion centers as well. The anti-Blackness racism, uh, by no means not the only type of racism that exists, but is the most extreme and most violent uh, form of racism that we see in the education system. When you introduced me, uh, Kelsey, uh, you, you said I'm a recovering teacher, and is a, that is a title that is a descript description that um, I'm carrying with me at the moment. I'm hoping to one day be able to say I'm a recovered teacher, but the truth is anyone who's ever been through any process of recovery, that recovery is a lifelong process, especially if you have been through a process of miseducation by a colonial system or settler colonial system, like I would imagine the majority of the people listening to this talk have been through. So my schooling, my uh, initial schooling was uh, based in the Italian, uh, uh, colonial system and then my secondary and higher education um, in this great country so of, of Britain so um, I have I, I consider myself quite a dangerous weapon in the classroom in that uh, I could be used to create great harm because of that colonial legacy that is embedded and ingrained in my, in all of my biases and all of my education, mis miseducation really is what I'm referring to. So I guess my point as an educator is that the work that we have to do, the abolitionist work that we have to do and the anti-racist work that we have to do has to really start with, the, start with the self, with the acknowledgement that perhaps education, like Gloria Latson Billing says, maybe it's not this nice, nice little field in the social sciences that we would like to think that is not as progressive, as liberal, as benevolent as we would like to imagine it to be, that grey harm is perpetrated uh, in our name, through us, by us, every single day, um, amongst the most vulnerable, uh, rendered, rendered vulnerable. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about no more exclusions at the work that we do. So we started about 18 months ago with the idea that we wanted to change the laws in this country. Uh, in uh, 
similar system to the US, uh, uh, Australia and South Africa. And I leave it hanging in the air what these four countries have in common. Um, <laughs> black children, racialized children, migrant children, brown children, uh, minoritized children are disproportionately represented uh, amongst the exclusion, or as they say in other countries, expulsion figures. Um, this is not a new thing. It's not in a, a thing that has just been brought about by austerity, although austerity over the last 10 years has, has for sure exacerbated the exclusion rates. Uh, but it's something that in, in, the, in the UK at least has been pretty uh, constant. We have official figures going back 20 years. Those of you who like numbers, like statistics, you can go on the Department for Education website the, the statistical data starts in 1997. So you have about, they always publish the year behind. So you'll probably get 21 years of data if you go there. But if you go to our uh, uh, ancestors and people that have been writing about this who are still alive actually, like Bernard Cord, who's a Grenadian revolutionary uh, who came to teach actually to Great Britain in 1968 and just thought, uh, what is going on? Why this? Overrepresentation of black and migrant children in special education schools. At that time, special education schools in Britain were called schools, hold, hold on to your seats, schools for the educationally subnormal. That was the official term. Uh, nowadays, the label has gone from ESN, educationally subnormal, to, in my view, this is what I've written about in my research to SEN, Special Educational Needs. So a little play with the acronym, but essentially you still see the same troubling, problematic, racialized and classed uh, patterns of over-representation and, and disabled, and um, also disab um, disabled, uh, patterns of over-representations of children who are black, minority, brown, Muslim, um, um, from poor communities, but not exclusively, because I'm gonna go into in a minute, the profile, the average profile of your average excluded black child is not the same as the pro profile of your average excluded white child in Britain. There's a great difference. So again, yes, we have to build solidarity, but what we must not is do, we know this is homogenize differences, right? We need to build solidarity across, but then we need to look at how intersectionally different axes of domination cut across communities and impact children and families. So um, going back to what we see in the proof, so I have so much I want to say, I've kind of lost my thought a little bit. I'm just wondering if um, in this process of recovery, if I can bring some teachers that are listening or educators or lecturers or anyone who's involved in education that writes behavior policies at school level, at district level, at local level, at regional level, at national level, at union level, the trade unions have a massive role to play with this, um, writing motions, right? Um, would you still support school exclusion, school expulsions if you knew that 70% of the adult prisoners population in this country has reported having been excluded. Would you still exclude children if you knew that 88% of all the boys in children prisons have been excluded and 74% of all the girls in children institution 12 to 17 have been excluded? Would you still do it if you knew that once you have excluded that child, only 1% will go on to achieve five GCSEs, which is the very bare minimum standard of education in this country. Would you still exclude these children if you knew that they would carry a lifelong stigma, the, the impact on their mental health, the ability to uh, obtain employment? We have stories, we've heard stories in no more exclusions of children, black children, but I'm sure it happens with white children and children from other uh, communities who are so ashamed, so ashamed of, of the fact they've been excluded that when relatives come to their home, they put on the school uniform and they lie and they tell those relatives, I'm still in school. This is the stigma, this is the shame, right? We, we're hearing about the breakdown of relationship, the way the child sees themselves, the hurt, the pain, the, the self idea of what, who am I? Those are the kind of things you figure out in school, right? Um, all those imaginings are taken away. The, 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 I mean, the impact of not belonging. What happens when we don't belong? I mean, that is a basic human need. What do we all do when we are, um, everyone can, can 
think of a, a situation in their life where we've been ostracized or excluded from a group. We can all think of it. How did you feel? Can you still remember? It actually, research shows that it, exclusion gives us physical pain, literally physical pain when we are excluded from our peer group. And how are children, because all children are vulnerable, but some children are made additionally vulnerable, right? So you've got the most vulnerable amongst the already vulnerable being made to cope with, with, with all of this, with not belonging, with the stigma, with the idea that I'm not valued uh, and, I, and I am another. Um, none of these things are new in Great Britain. I mean, the main reason why I've come on to, to, to do this thing actually, Kelsey, is because I really want to dislodge the idea that education is a nice field. I'm sorry, it's rotten to the core. Um, I am not proud to be a teacher. I am not going to be proud to be a teacher and feel until things change. And I'm going to continue to be a teacher, a teacher in recovery. And I hope that the other people start to start to look at things this way and perhaps adopt this label and, and start shaking things up. How can you go back to school and change things? I suppose that that's what we want to do when we do our abolitionist reimagining right because it's not enough to take on all the blame and guilt and and then what and then center yourself yet again which is what whiteness does no we're not doing that what we need to do is take the framework take the lessons take the readings take the statistics by the way we don't need any more reports we don't need any more reviews we don't need any more recommendations we don't need any more announcements right what we need is actions that is sustained today, tomorrow, and beyond this moment with Black Lives Matter. And I'm going to leave there. Oh, well, you don't want another review committee or an inquiry? Is that I not don't. Right? I don't. We're done. We're <laughs> done. I don't want to see it. What are you campaigning for? I'm not. Thank you so much, Zara. That you're always incredible when you speak. And I think a lot of people really feel what you're saying. Um, I'm gonna, oh, I realized I haven't actually put my, um, yeah, thank you so much, Zara. And um, I'm just gonna hand it straight, straight over to Lola, I think. Um, I think it all, it's all starting to fit together very nicely. So I'm gonna let Lola um, go for it. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm in somewhere that's maybe quite loud. So let me know at any point if you can't hear me because of the rain. Um, so I really wanted to, well, first of all, I want to say thank you to all of the incredible speakers. It's been so lovely to listen to you and it's been such a generative conversation. Um, I want to say thank you to Kelsey and thank you to Kate, especially um, for putting this on. So I want to kind of come at this um, from, the, from uh, the angle of thinking through and about sexual violence, right? The question of what about the rapists? What about um, a kind of serious crime? Um, and first, I want to start by saying that I think of feminism, which I'm kind of uh, going to talk about an abolitionist logic through, because I, th I think of feminism absolutely as an abolitionist um, kind of logic and political methodology. Um, so the way I talk about feminism is thinking about feminism as a political methodology we can use to make demands for our freedom and the freedom of others. And I, I see it as something um, that is specifically concerned with ending suffering and ending proximity to violence. Um, and so I want to approach this question about, um, like, what about the race? What about the rapists? Um, assuming that it's been asked in good faith, because I think a lot of people who do abolitionist work kind of avoid this question for obvious reasons, because um, often it's used to kind of obscure or elide um, the demands that that um, abolitionists make. But I want to kind of come at it, um, it and offer a, a kind of good faith um, answer. So I think the first thing um, to do that's really important um, is to think about what people are asking when they ask this kind of question. Um, I think that what people are asking when they ask this question is they're invoking an idea that an abolitionist logic means no, co uh, no consequences for perpetrators um, of violent crime and therefore an abolitionist logic cannot keep us safe. But I think that that framing already betrays what, what an abolitionist logic asks of us um, because it rests on the premise that we need solutions to deal um, with crime after the fact, instead of thinking about the conditions that make certain kinds of violence possible. 
Um, I think also when um, people ask this question, they're invoking this idea of chaos, right? So without police, without prisons, everything, uh, there would be no control. Every, everybody would you know, act on impulse and that would put us, um, and it, it's important to think about um, what we, um, who we mean when we say us, that would put us in danger. Um, but I think about the world that we're living in now, um, the world uh, where we're seeing people being slaughtered by police um, on the streets, a world that depends on the exploit, um, ex exploitation and expropriation of um, specific people's labor, the world in, uh, a world in which um, sexual violence is rife. And to me, that is a chaotic world. I think this illusion of order that we have um, is not something that really exists. And if we think critically about the moments that we're living in, if we think critically about our own communities, and if we think critically about whether we actually feel safe and who feels safe to call the police and um, for whom calling the police has meant death, I think this idea of order um, absolutely falls apart. Um, so I, I want to start by saying abolition is about thinking about the conditions that make crime possible. So if we ask this question, we have to ask, what are the conditions that make rape possible? So we have to think about a rigid gender binary in which um, domination and subordination are clearly fixed in certain people's bodies. We have to think about the myth of the carceral solution that treats violence as if it's inevitable and treats violence as if it can only be stopped after it it has happened. Um, we have to think about capitalism, which depends on exploitation and embeds ideas of hierarchies and disposabilities, um, disposability into um, certain people's bodies, which I think are logics that are central to um, rape, right? Um, and we also have to think about things like the nuclear family that rigidly um, kind of sets in place uh, specific roles for individuals, has been central to the subordination of women over centuries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it's also important to think um, about what, when we're approaching this question about violent crime or approaching this question as feminists about rapists, I think it's also um, a pertinent for us to really unpick what the idea of crime is and to recognize that crime itself is a, a construct and that law and legality frame um, certain actions as uh, crimes and frame certain um, uh, uh, law and legality kind of construct who can call themselves a victim. So if you look at like what the legal definition of, of rape is and um, just a, a bit warning that my language is going to be a bit graphic, um, the, the legal definition of rape uh, states that rape is a vaginal, anal or oral penetration without consent by someone with a penis. And we know that that definition in law, we know the framework of law that, around, um, that exists around that already um, precludes and already excludes so many people from being able to frame themselves um, as a victim, right? Or being able to frame within the language of, of the law, the idea that uh, um, a kind of violation has happened to them. Um, and so, if we even if we were to depend on the kind of carceral logics, if, if we were to depend on that um, kind of system of justice, it already falls apart because it means that whole swaths of, of the population, queer lives, trans lives, etc., are, are not able to frame themselves as victims within the language of the law. So, so the law as a construct, the the idea of crime already doesn't apply to everyone. And then on top of that, we've we have had historically communities across the world for whom calling the police has meant death, point blank. And so they, they have found ways and methods to deal with violent crime, to deal with sexual violence, to, to deal with a whole manner of issues by themselves because they've never ever been um, allowed into um, the kind of frame of protection that the state claims that it offers to certain people. Um, so I, I wanna like keep with this idea that some of us are constructed outside of the realm of legitimate victimhood, right? So that means that already if we're using feminism as a principle that um, is supposed to uh, apply to all of our lives, we have to rethink how we're thinking um, about what justice is, what it looks like, what abolition looks like, what freedom looks like. Um, what do we know about sexual violence? We know that women are most likely to um, experience sexual violence. We know that they're most likely to experience it from a family member or from someone that um, they know. And we know in this country, roughly 80, um, 80 to 85% of victims don't report to the police. Less than five reported rapes actually end um, uh, sorry, less than 5% of, of reported rapes actually end in conviction. But th the question is not to say that more convictions would make the problem go away. I think the question is to be honest about the lie um, that we've been, um, the lie that we've been sold that uh, justice is served when individuals go to prison or when the state disappears an individual abuser. Um, Abolition as I understand it and abolition as I'm coming to understand it being surrounded by all of these incredible thinkers is, is, is about not re reproducing the harm that has been enacted 
on you, right? It's, it's about undoing this idea that there are some people who are deserving of punishment and deserving of disappearance. And there are some people who are deserving to of um, building a life, deserving of having a family, deserving of love and deserving of care. Um, I think the prison and the police are, very, are a very individualistic response um, to crime. The problem of crime um, and if we claim as feminists as people who care about the world to, to want to um, make a claim that everybody deserves to have a livable everybody deserves a livable life um, we have to proceed remembering this and I, I think we also have to be honest about how kind of entire anti-rape movements have been built on the idea of getting bad men off the street that there's an entire canon especially of feminist literature that is dedicated to the idea of the single the single abuser the single man that's waiting in the bush to to rape us as we walk to um, walk down the street. But I think when we reframe it and say, um, and Alison Phipps talks really well about this idea of like the singular bad man, when we recognize that, okay, the bad man is our brother and our uncle and our friend, the bad man is the president, the bad man is the police officer who says he will protect us, what do we do then? It, and I think when people start to think about it in that way, it can seem um, like an incredibly overwhelming uh, realization to come to but I see it as um, actually providing us with some idea that because uh, we are most likely to experience sexual violence from people that we know and from family members etc I think we have a lot more agency than outside state actors to control what happens to us as individuals as communities of women non-binary people as communities together we have a lot more say in how we might disrupt violent um and uh uh yeah violent uh, cycles of behavior um how we might uh instill in people a, a sense of um uh, ownership and agency how we might stop in its tracks um uh violent thoughts right um that, that might lead people to behave in certain ways i also wanted to um kind of touch on the criminal justice system so I think also when we're talking about um, the problem of sexual violence or the problem of rape, um, because our logics are based on this notion that some people are deserving of freedom and others aren't, we often don't see the prison as a site or a space uh, in which sexual violence takes place. And we know that prisons are rife with sexual violence and um, uh, instances of suicide. So if we really care about ending sexual violence um, and we don't um, kind of use an abolitionist logic, are we saying that we're okay with some people experiencing sexual violence over there in the dark and the people who are deserving of freedom, of innocence, of healing, out here in the light are the only people that we're gonna um, kind of uh, uh, care about. I also wanna kind of touch on how built into policing as we've heard before are all of these kinds of methods um, to which I think sexual violence and sexual assault are key. The, the idea of the strip search, the idea of searching somebody's body, the idea of invading somebody's um, uh, personal space and agency. Um, I think those are all um, kind of, uh, those are all actions that as feminists we are familiar with in terms of what it means to have um, a bodily invasion to experience a bodily invasion um, and so when we recognize that uh, you know ideas of um, uh, sexual violence is kind of embedded in the way that the police operate even in the methods and the tactics that we use then we understand that they're not a body that, that is reformable right they're not a body that can um, uh, suddenly change with a few measures here and there um, we also know that um, prisons aren't known to rehabilitate individuals. So we know that sending people away is not the way that we will end rape, essentially. Um, I, I kind of wanna to touch on um, also the, the neat little lie that carceral feminism, which is um, feminism that is invested in police and prisons and carceral solutions to these problems, um, the, the, the neat little lie it tells us about um, the idea that justice is provided by the police, the courts and the justice system, it kind of pre prescribes a beginning and end um, to justice as, as if it were a containable linear um, uh, process and leaves no space for us to be messy, leaves no space for us to feel the wrong things, feel the right things, etc. Um, I think also 
what it does is kind of turn gendered violence into containable instances that disappear the second somebody is taken away. And it erases um, the multi-layered experiences of harm um, that bonds survivors to the to perpetrators and means that we can both be survivors and um, perpetrate violence at, at exactly the same time. There's no space in carceral logics to understand what that means and how that will affect us uh, physically, emotionally, psychologically. I think also I want to get to this point of um, the way that abolitionist logics are, are often constructed on um, by people on the outside as mercy or a lack of accountability or somehow asking survivors not to be angry about the violence that is enacted on them. And I don't think that that's what an abolitionist po politic does. I think I think what it does is say that there might be another method that we can use that could end harm for good and that no other uh, approach takes seriously the idea that violence is not an, uh, an inevitability. Um, I think it, it doesn't ask us to simply accept what happens to us. Um, and I think it, I think it asks um, us to advocate for another way of thinking about violence and punishment um, for those that want to seek you know, systems of care and refuge that might enable um, transformation instead of subjecting survivors to a re-traumatizing experience inside the police machine, right? Um, and so I just, I, I kind of want to close um, by, by coming, um, coming back to this point of um, agency, the, the agency and the power that we have as, com as whole communities to stop violence in a way that policing and prisons can never do and policing and prisons will, will never do. I, I always think of this Jackie Wang quote where she says, the prison is a problem for, uh, for thought that can only be unthought if we refuse to capitulate to the realism of the present. And I think the realism of, of the present is always this overarching specter that sits on our imaginations and makes things seem impossible. So what an abolitionist logic is also asking you to do is to give up the idea, um, to, to give up what you've been told about what justice is and to give up um, what you've been told about um, the way that people should live their lives and what it means to be a victim and what it means to be a perpetrator. So what does, what could an abolitionist, you know, approach to sexual violence look like? One, I wanna say it's okay not to know. Um, there are so many hegemonic forces kind of sitting on our imaginations that, at all time that make it literally impossible to see through the machineries of exploitation that order the way that we live. So it's okay to not have every single answer, um, but I think it could also look like um, uh, community solutions to uh, uh, the problem of uh, uh, not feeling safe, right? So what if you were outside or you, you were somewhere unfamiliar and you knew um, you could go to a safe place um, where somebody would look after you, somebody would ensure that you got home safe, that you were supported, that you could sit with someone and talk about the experience um, of not feeling safe walking down the street. Um, it means, I think, also making things like whisper networks public. I, I think whole kind of communities rely on, especially communities of women, rely on the idea of warning people about perpetrators, warning them about people who enact or have enacted or have patent um, or, or have um, kind of... Uh, uh, histories of enacting patterns of behavior, right? And I think what happens if we make those lists public is that we have more power and more control over where it is um, we place our energy, over how we hold individuals accountable, um, and over um, how we deal with the problem of sexual violence. Um, I think it also means looking at critical and radical sexual education from an early age, dismantling the violent domination that constitutes um, masculinity, and think and and totally thinking beyond the kind of gender binary. Um, I think it also means abolishing capitalism and all forms of hierarchy, because I think what rape is is, is an enactment of power over somebody else's body, and in a world where those power differentials were non-existent it would become harder to justify but in the in the world that we live in I think rape is incredibly easy to justify for that reason um, and it also looks like crafting uh, um, accountability processes for people who have perpetrated harm um, that will look different depending on context and who is involved in those processes and we see those processes happening in kind of activist circles in um in a smaller way in communities. And we've seen the ways that they can be successful. And we've also seen the ways that there can be holes in them if we don't fully commit to an abolitionist logic. I think I'll stop there. Um, but yeah, I, I, I hope that that has really addressed a lot of the concerns that lie behind the what about the rapist question. And I hope that people who kind of come with this question or come with the, the kind of mantra of, of serious crime um, 
really do some reflection and think about where um, the need to um, think solely about crime instead of the conditions that create crime comes from. Thank you so much, Lola. Um, everyone has been absolutely incredible and uh, I'm just really honored to uh, be in relationship with all of you and in community with all of you to, to be able to have these discussions. Um, I'm gonna let us take like a very a short break. Um, so we'll have 20 minutes at the end to make sure that we can answer some questions. Um, uh, but just going to give people five minutes now to be able to put their questions either on Facebook on the live stream or in this chat box and we'll go through them. Um, and yeah, if you just want to uh, take care of any any of your needs in this five minutes, um, I'm going to turn my camera off and we're going to, yeah, we'll be back in five minutes.
Um, is everyone hearing that thunder now? The storm's really taken on. All right, I hope you all had a nice little break. Um, I'm just going through some of these questions. I um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, um, thank you so much. That first half was incredible. I learned so much every time I speak to any of you. And I'm sure that everyone here has learned so much already. Um, we have some questions. I think Lola, towards the end, you gave like a really um, comprehensive sort of explanation of abolition itself. Um, oh, I don't know if you can hear that um, in the background. Um, the very nice so I'm gonna, I suppose if we were going to be explaining abolition for the first time to someone, would anyone like to give sort of like a little overview of what the abolitionist movement actually means um, for newcomers? Um, if not, I can speak a little bit about abolitionist work that's going on right now. I think I mentioned in the beginning that I was going to say about some successes and then I didn't do that. Um, so I'm going to say that now. Um, this is both in the US and the UK. Um, is, that, is that very audible? Can you hear the rain in the background? A little bit? Um, hopefully you can still hear me. Um, so I was lucky enough last year to join a tour of the southern states in the US with a group called Fight Toxic Prisons. Um, and they have been doing some incredible work around the intersections of prisons and environmentalism and noting that there is also like a very deep link between land justice, uh, indigenous justice, um, environmental issues and incarceration. Um, and uh, recent last year uh, through their organizing of resisting prisons on through environmental grounds as well as through an abolitionist lens so understanding that most prisons are built also on toxic land so on radioactive land or where they've stored nuclear waste or um, you know land that no one else wants basically and isn't safe so where they'll have unsafe water supplies things like that um but also that understanding that all prisons themselves are toxic that being incarcerated being isolated being abused being in a cage being denied medical treatment and healthy food and sunlight and all these things that is itself is toxic to your body and your mind um and uh, to be dehumanized in that way itself. But they had a really big win last year where the biggest uh, planned federal prison um, in the US that was going to be built in Kentucky, um, that plan has now been scrapped because of the organizing that was gonna be a $500 million um, project and that has now been scrapped. Um, in San Francisco, the coalition to um, close down 850 Bryant, the jail there, that has now um, been announced that that has been successful. Um, the, uh, I know in Atlanta, um, I got to meet uh, some of the people from the Women on the Rise um, campaign and the Close the Jail ATL, where a city jail that was built, uh, I, think, I think it was for when, and Chelsea will know more about this than me, but. This yeah, 1996. Jail, yeah. It was, was built for the Olympics. Exactly, and so the it was. Like, there poor people, yeah. yeah clean up Atlanta, take all the homeless people off the street and put them in this jail. And then after the Olympics, obviously that jail stayed there. And now it's been closed, I believe, or is closing. And it, they have won a campaign to build a wellness and freedom center on that site. And so, as you can see, a lot of this abolitionist work, it's not just about getting people out of prison, um, which it absolutely is about that as well. Decarceration is huge, but as many of our, um, our comrades like push that it's not just, it's not abolitionist to just let people out of prison and throw them out on the street. It's about having homes that are stable and safe to live in and a fulfilling life that will 
um, and conditions that are suitable and decent for you where you can thrive and experience joy that is what would be abolition it's not just getting people out of prison but there are definitely people who are um, running bail funds and uh, closing down jails and on those sites managing to open up things that are for the benefit of the community and something around transforming those sites of violence is really, really important. In the UK as well, um, we've managed to CAPE, uh, I'll talk about CAPE quickly. CAPE is a organization that started in 2016 after the government, the Tories announced that they were going to build nine mega prisons across um, England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and as you know, like I don't think we all, all we all don't, we don't always make the connection between policing and prisons. But if they build these prisons, they will absolutely not defund the police and stop policing us because they have to fill those prisons. They will continue to police and surveil us in order to fill those spaces. So if we reduce the amount of prisons that they have, then they cannot fill them, and they have to start to think about what else are we going to do to meet people's needs because um, prisons are not it. Um, and that campaign is ongoing. One prison has been scrapped, the one that was in, going to be in Port Talbot in South Wales. That through community organizing, that plan is not going ahead. And most of the other prisons have been delayed, but there are two in the Midlands that are starting to go ahead. Um, and so that, that campaign is ongoing. Um, that is campaigning that is through online means, through petitions. We've actually just today, I think, um, released a petition that we'll share as well that is to demand that they don't spend a billion pounds building all these prisons and they actually put that money into our communities, particularly at this moment when they're trying to continue on with building all these prisons um, in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, so please everyone sign that. Um, and abolitionist work also looks like building transformation, building that community support. So that has been around how do we educate people around gender and about racism? How do we start to dismantle those things within ourselves and within the organizations that we are part of and the institutions? It is also about creating those alternatives. So the ways that we support each other and provide alternative support for survivors, whether that's through finding housing or, um, doing mediations and accountability processes, working with perpetrators sometimes to try and uh, create that transformation in situations where people just simply, and this is something that came up in the comments, that sometimes survivors are made to feel bad for not wanting their perpetrator to go to prison, but particularly as people of color and as black people, those communities know that often the stakes are so high that prison is so bad that that is not something that we want to put our communities through. We still want violence to end, but we don't necessarily need to lead it to need to lead to all these other issues. You know, I know people who maybe their family member was abusing them and maybe that person did eventually go to prison, but then they ended up homeless because that was the breadwinner of the family. And then they experienced more abuse after that. And these things are not it doesn't provide that solution and potentially that person is just going to come out of prison even angrier you know like that that is not what has helped so many of us and so finding these um finding ways to build these alternatives has been really really important an organization i'm part of called cradle community um, is dedicated to transformative justice and trying to build accountability um, within other activist organizations and also just within our communities so um, we've been running mediations and uh, yeah, these kinds of things as well. Um, does anyone else want to come in on this and share some work that is being done, Chelsea? Um, yes, just quickly. So, um, and please no one get angry at me if I mispronounce a name because I'm going out of memory, but I'm thinking of, um, just a lot of violence prevention organizations and gun dieback programs, particularly in Chicago and in New York City. And if you just look up like gun buyback violence prevention, domestic violence prevention in Brooklyn, New York, because um, I don't want to misstate the name. Um, but I know in Atlanta that growing up, especially like coming up in the movement as a student activist, we had we had our own security. And they're called the street groomers. You can look them up. Street groomers Atlanta. 
it was started by this guy. Um, I don't remember his name, but when I tell you guys, when I tell y'all he's almost seven feet tall, like he uses his physical ability and he goes into communities and works with low risk, you know, young folk who may be a little rambunctious, may have tempers, may, you know what I'm saying? Get in fights in, in the neighborhood and he helps them to channel that. And so the name street groomers, it comes from the fact that they actually like pick up trash and organize and clean up neighborhoods, but they also serve as protection um, from anyone from your grandma who's walking to the store in, in that neighborhood on the east side near Gresham Road to we had protests when the police were being wild when we, you know, were doing a sit in or die in or whatever and the street groomers would make a, a box around us. So I want to lift up um the fact that uh, and as I think it was Lola um, who said earlier that communities who've already been excluded from being protected by the police are already coming up with ways to protect themselves so I think in a lot of ways for me growing up as a black woman in America I saw daily abolition in, in practice it just wasn't called that because that theory and that language wasn't there, but in the reality, we knew that we had a few guys in the neighborhood that you would call if somebody was out. And now I'm sharing abolition graphics that say, isn't that what abolition looks like? So um, yeah, I just wanted to raise the street groomers, violence prevention and gun buyback programs in Chicago. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for raising that it is that Often we haven't used these words, but in many communities we have been doing this work. The way that I've spoken to elders in my family about this work has not been using the word abolition, but has been understanding the fact that we have housed people who have had to escape abusive people. And we have set up, uh, you know, little schemes to make sure that we can look out for each other in different scenarios. Something else that I saw in the South, um, were organizers that, I mean, bystander intervention is something that we do and that I think is like great abolitionist practice, practice which is um, when we witness violence, finding ways to intervene and get other people involved so that we break the silence when we witness violence in public space or when we know that someone is being abused and we don't say anything, all of those things are bystander intervention. But even simple things like knowing when communities are being highly policed and being able to identify things like in the US, um, because we don't, I mean, I live in London, so we don't have the same kind of car culture, but obviously there's cities in the US where people rely on their cars massively. And the police obviously use things like, oh, broken tail lights or things like that as reasons to pull over black people and then perpetrate violence against them. But then having schemes where, you know, a local mechanic will go around and make sure that everyone's brake lights are fixed and do these kinds of things for free and try and like use the resources in our communities to limit contact with those state services and that can be childcare, that can be all these kinds of things that try and like limit that interaction with these violent state services and those violent state services include police, they include the prisons and the court system but they also include mental health services often um, and they also include um, immigration detention centres and the home office um, and um, I was going to say something else um, and someone is also uh, um, making the point in the chat as well about uh, the disproportionate amount of violence that disabled folks also experience um, and the way that they are dehumanized. Um, and there are definitely a lot of this work also comes from disability justice and understanding that the state also um, perpetrates violence and creates disability um, by the way that we structure society. And so if we can start to support people in radical ways where we change the circumstances so that they um so that your mental health or your disability is not this thing that is going to create marginalization for you um but is something that is just part of your life like anyone else um i think we should okay zara can you speak a little bit about schools how schools would look like if disabled people were welcome and um and we ended that kind of segregation in education so, um, I was born in 1975. Everyone can do the maths. 
1977, when I was two, so I'm not going to pretend I'd remember it, the education system in Italy became fully inclusive. They decided overnight they're going to shut special schools. Guess what? We survived. Um, and they never looked back. And far from being a perfect system, deeply racist country, uh, Italy is why I left at the age of 16. Um, one thing they did do is ensure that no child would be excluded uh, or rendered special, disabled, um, abnormal, unteachable. Um, and so I don't wanna perpetrate the idea that inclusive education, um, if you remember what I said earlier about it, the, the, the system as it is, is functioning exactly as it was designed to, and that's why we need a complete rethink. When people say, well, your abolitionist thinking can't happen overnight, um, it's too radical. Well, wasn't COVID radical? Didn't we shut the whole shit operation down overnight? Um, so I'm not quite sure where we can go now from here, now that we've seen what can be done, what kind of emergency measures can be taken literally overnight. A whole cohort okay, of students that call me and call some of, some of the people in NME absolutely distraught because their exams, they've been working all their lives towards the dream they've been sold was taken away overnight. The trauma that caused them. I thought they'll all be relieved. They were traumatized. They were like, well, what do you mean? We're not gonna have an exam. Uh, what does that mean? How's the university gonna see us? Uh, literally the whole idea of what education about reduced to a number or, or a letter of the alphabet. And so my point is, if we can make those drastic, take those drastic measures and decisions overnight, why can't we do that um, when it comes to inclusion, when it comes to disability, uh, when it comes to racialized disability, because I want to I want to inject a little bit of in intersectionality into this. The SEND movement in this country is a white movement. The black disabled children are invisibilized yet again. So one thing I want to do, I want to shout out Marguerite Hay. I want to shout out Vanessa Bob. And I want to shout out the other black women in particular that are working to undo that harm. That is harm upon harm, right? Um, that is being done, not just via racialization, but also through, through the process of, of, of applying, you know, disabled deficit models. You know, I mean, the education system is built on ability. Who is able, who is able to do this? Top groups, middle group, bottom group, right? So the whole idea of creating a pyramid for social order that all of us are fighting against is, to be honest, is begins with the education system. Black children being excluded as young as three and four. This is from kindergarten, from nursery, right? My own daughter, the age of two, told by her nursery manager, doesn't she look rebellious when her Afro is out? Um, this is what our children are having to deal with, this type of violence on a daily basis for as soon as we expose them to the structures that govern us. So this is why it's, it's, it's um, upon us to be able to imagine, to be bold, to be brave. That's what abolitionism is about. Um, and I'm gonna finish on solidarity because at the moment there's a lot of performative solidarity that's pissing me off, really pissing me off. I cannot take, please do not, do not hashtag me any of that shit. What I don't wanna see is uh, any more one talking about, I'm gonna retweet your movement. I'm gonna, this is all fucking performative. What we need to do, we need people to do solidarity work to decenter themselves, to stop talking about how they don't wanna feel guilty because they're white or whatever. Nobody said to you need to feel guilty because you're white. What we need to all do is work together to dismantle ideologies, world views, right? The, these hierarchies, these racialized class hierarchies that are not serving us. So don't talk to me about uh, how, how, how guilty you feel or what books you can read. These are the books, go buy them. Yeah, there you go. What is this one? Woo! This one, definitely. Read this one. Bettina Love. Yeah. So if anybody wants to know where do I start with education and abolition, go to Bettina Love, go to Angela Davis, for goodness sake. You start, you, you don't need, to be honest, you read Angela Davis, you don't need to read anything else. And, and go for that. And James Baldwin. And I'm going to leave it there. Thanks so much, Zara.
Um, okay, we've got lots of questions. Um, is it, it's six o'clock now. Is everyone, we're going to go over by maybe 10 minutes, I think, because we started a bit late. If, if the speakers are okay with that, okay to hang out for another 10 minutes. Um, so, <laughs> Um, we are right at the end, I'll say how people can get involved in a couple more things as well. And any books that you've all mentioned, if you can send those to me and we can, and we can add them as well. There's been a few clarification things. Um, and I wondered if um, this is one that I know me and Angelica have spoken about quite a lot, um, which is around the role of um, police and like cops in media and in TV and entertainment. Um, I personally feel very strongly around abolition and, and this idea of us being able to imagine outside of these structures and at the moment when we're being constantly flooded with police on TV and these good, good guy, bad guy narratives and these kinds of things that, that it's really interfering with our ways of thinking of other ways that we could deal with issues that aren't outsourcing it. So I wonder if um, Angelica um, or Lola would like to speak on this. Put your hand up if you want to. Okay, I'll say something really quickly. I mean, it's completely, um, it's propaganda, it's ideological. Um, I mean, it's interesting to see how depictions of the criminal justice system and in particular um, police have changed over the last 10 years, especially in response to um, Black Lives Matter and um, how, um, police violence has been put on the agenda and has become more visible as an issue. So um, I guess, obviously, they've tried to like grapple with this whole, okay, the police are just there to protect us by trying to address it. But the way I've noticed two ways, one is placing a black character as either someone like the head police officer or the judge, which is a way of like giving black people a power that they don't have like structurally in real life um but making them the most powerful character um in a tv show as a way of kind of it's so subtle as a way of kind of maybe paying lip service to the issue or trying to represent black people or people of color in media but also at the same time erasing like the violence that the police and the prison system, the criminal justice system play. Also, um, this you can see this with the representation of queer people um, and other minorities as well. I think Brooklyn Nine-Nine is a really good example of this. I personally don't watch it, but I know it's very popular. You know, it's funny. Um, and even, I think it's a show that does address racism in the police force. But it's, it's still propaganda because at the end of the day, it's providing comic relief and it's not acknowledging the fact that structurally as an institution, this is a system that is inherited from slavery and any kind of positive portrayal of cops upholds the prison system. So it's interesting. I've been seeing just anecdotally on Twitter, people saying like this kind of stuff has to go um even Brooklyn Nine-Nine like has it has to go and I will be interested to see how Hollywood does respond um I don't know if it means it will be the end of like police dramas and police shows because they're so popular and I definitely think they have played a huge role in maintaining this idea that you know the police are here to serve and protect us initially the idea was oh it's just a few bad apples there's a few bad apples now it's like it's a few good apples um, but still, there isn't a reckoning with the structural, um, like systemic problem, like of the police as a force, as an institution that as um, Chelsea has said so incredibly, basically comes from former slave patrols um, and slavery and yeah, imperial violence. So that's what I have to say about, I don't know if Lola has anything else to add. Um, yeah, I really just want to echo what you said. And as you were thinking, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about like um, the figure of the sex worker in things like um, I don't watch any of these shows 
SUV like what are they called <laughs> grappling for examples because I don't, I don't, yeah. want, I don't, know. don't know. Well, well, give me give somebody give me an example no, no, I don't know sorry no, 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 no. SVU SVU sorry sorry thank you Vera um but yeah I, I was thinking about the figure of the sex worker um and how you know um in those in these cop shows in shows in general the sex worker is always dead is always in in need of help by the police um and the, the the police are always framed as kind of like saviors, right? And I think that goes uh, just to echo what um, Angelica said. That goes so much, um, such a long way in kind of reifying, especially around sex work, this idea of police officers as saviors who save sex workers from um, trafficking, or police officers who raid brothels um, and save sex workers from their um, from from pimps who are exploiting them, and I think once we reckon with the the kind of structural violences that place sex workers in a kind of unique position, we can also see how the police um, are are f fundamentally a force that at the very least make their lives harder, right? I'm thinking specifically about the raid that happened in Soho, um, which led to a number of deaths and deportations where the police raided um, brothels with the aim of saving um, sex workers and, and ended up just deporting them. And so we have to, I feel like, like you were saying, we have to be um, kind of honest about um, what what the kind of um, machine of liberal representation does, right? It's supposed to endear us and it, it's supposed to create, it, yeah, it's supposed to endear us to um, the police and to uh, kind of reify their power. I also wanted to say um, just before, like people were talking about what does abolition look like? I think it, abolition begins at home, really. I think ask yourself if, you, if you're thinking about, if you're somebody who's thinking about wanting to extend an abolitionist logic into their everyday day life, um, do you know your neighbors? Do you know more about your neighbors than just like what their names and their professions are? Do you feel like you could reach out to your neighbors if you needed help? Do, do you feel like you've created a network of care, which means they could come to you if they needed help outside of, um, you know, beyond the council, beyond, um, uh, uh, all, all of these other different kind of machineries. I think what's really interesting, especially in the way that um, mutual aid groups are, are organizing right now, is that you have a whole host of kind of active um, and radical organizers who are saying, listen, we don't need to rely on these people. We can do it ourselves. Do you need a thermometer? I have one at my house. I can drive it to you, et cetera. And then you have people saying, no, 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 we should wait for the for the uh, council issued thermometer. We should you know, make sure the council knows our every move, et cetera. And I, I just want to express to people how that is also a counter, how, how that is, how that also um, should be seen as a block to uh, establishing abolitionist thinking in the ways that um, uh, we organize with one another. I think it's that thing of getting rid of the permission, the idea that we do not need permission to act. We do not need permission to intervene if we see a, an illegal stop and search happening. We should be kind of, I hate the word empowered, but we should know enough about the way that these systems operate, that we're able to intervene confidently and in ways that help to keep people safe. Thank you so much, Lola. Um, could I? Oh, go, yeah. go ahead, Kay, if you're about to transition. Yeah, please, Chelsea. I'm gonna, yeah. yeah, so I wanted to jump on this point for a couple of different, um, just connecting a couple of different of Angelica and Lola's point. Um, from the very beginning, speaking about Black faces in high places, um, one of my favorite kind of quotes going around social media right now is, most black faces in high places are more loyal to the high places than to the black faces, right? Now, and I'm gonna try to be quick with this story, but my Thank background you. is being a black woman from Atlanta, which is considered the black Mecca of, um, of America, which has had a black mayor continually since 1970, um, which we've had black women mayors that have won international awards, but that same mayor closed every single public housing unit in the city. Um, we, you know, we talked about the 1996 Olympics, which is looked at as, oh, this black leadership and they have the Olympics in their city, but they locked up all the poor and homeless uh, and, and, and folks that were out and didn't have access to housing. They, they demolished more than half of People's Town to build the Olympic Centennial Olympic Park. So me growing up in Atlanta and knowing the history of Atlanta and how classes and racist and how capitalism will get in the bed with racism and they'll just have a great party at the expense 
of the least powerful, the least, um, and when I say powerful, I don't mean real power, right? Because people power, we all have that power. Disabled folks are not less powerful. You know what I'm saying? Trans folks are not less powerful. That's not what I'm saying. But in the confines of, you know, the system that we work in, the people who are, whose power is stripped from them, let's say that, that those folks always bear the brunt. So my homeboys who get pulled over by the police in America every single day, Barack Obama's eight platform, eight uh, point platform of kill 72% less black people. Look, because my homies that I'm concerned about every single day, just leaving their house, and me living in the UK, I live in Oxford, which I joke to my partner all the time. I live in a police bubble because if there's anywhere in this country where even as a black woman, I'm gonna have the least contact with police. It's gonna be on the campus of the Imperial University. So, but even in that experience, like racial profiling, all these other things. So as a black woman from America who's here to listen to the birthplace of the racism, of the white supremacy, of the colonial logics, of the violence, of the imperialism, of the war, of the capitalism, have the audacity to talk about America. It's just, so sorry, the last thing I want to say is actually much more positive. And it's advice to people that are listening. One of the number one things that I find frustrating is people think that being an abolitionist or fighting for racial justice, being an anti-racist means you have to be an activist. Let's be clear. I'm an activist and I'm pretty sure everybody else in this call is an activist out of necessity and literally like, if I don't do this, I'm gonna die because I have to help my people not die, right? I don't wanna do this. Like being an activist is not what people should be devoting their lives to is eliminating systems of oppression. So if you have this mindset that because you're not an activist, you can't say anything, you are the reason why we can't sleep. You are the reason why we're staying up till four o'clock in the morning. You are the reason why I have so many emails in my inbox that I haven't responded to. You are the reason why people are trying to connect, are trying to sleep, are trying to love themselves and just survive. Um, um, Someone earlier said that, you know, people are grieving while you're learning. So the reality of this moment is nobody's supposed to be an activist because we all supposed to be free. So help us, help me stop being an activist. Help me stop writing about. So no, you don't have to be a scholar who studied everything I've studied to talk about police and prisons and race. No, I don't want to study it anymore. Help me stop. And the way that you do that is every single profession, every single neighborhood, every single person, you can be abolitionists doing that. We have an abolitionist teacher on the line. We have abolitionist uh, folks who, who are working with survivors who, who you can do anything. You're a janitor, be an abolitionist janitor. If somebody calls the security guard where you work, stand up. You know what I'm saying? Stand, stand in that and say, uh, actually, do we need to call security? I think, I think they were fine. If, if you're a barista, and you have a coworker who never puts the right milk in black people's coffee, call, call her out. And I, I, I know I'm using these very micro level examples, but I do that to put people at ease. So you don't feel like, oh my gosh, I need to go organize an action in London where 500 people come. Please don't do that. Cause you don't know anything about organizing anything and you won't keep those folks safe. So get in where you fit in, do where you can. Everyone can be an abolitionist. Everyone can be anti-racist. and you, yes, you have to do the reading. Yes, you have to dig in your pockets. And yes, you have to listen to people who know more than you, but that's life. Thank you so much. Does anyone else want to share some final thoughts um, from the panel? Zara, did you have any nuggets you wanted to end with? No, I just want to say to everyone, thank you for letting me vent my anger, my frustration. Um, thank you so much for organizing, Kelsey. I'm so happy to have been sharing this, like, I struggle with Zoom, hence why my camera is off a lot, because I struggle with, like, looking into a screen and it causes me not to sleep. But everything that we discuss causes us, and I love what Chelsea did at the end, help us to stop having to lose sleep, having to be afraid for our children leaving the house. Um, 
being afraid of, you know, what the future holds, you know, will we get a job after all this education, after all this Oxford, UCL, Goldsmith, and all these uh, amazing institutions, will our children have a future that is free, that is safe, that is happy? That's all we want. So please, everyone that's listening, do the work. Stop asking us what to read. There is Google. Thank you, love you. Thank you so much. Um, Laura, um, can I, can I just, um, I just want to end on, on um, this thing that, that I've been thinking about, about how we ask the question about um, others joining in in this, in, in uh, adopting an abolitionist approach in their lives and for the sake of themselves and for other people, right? I think it's less, I really like reject the a kind of allyship um, frame, framing because I think it, it elides how, um, how much our lives are connected to one another, right? And how much, um, I, I, I constantly think about this idea of like, even if you are somebody who will not experience a specific kind of harm if the police are called, do you wish to be um, the recipient of a kind of protection that means other people have to die so that you feel safe? Is that something that you really, really, I, I, want, I, I wanted to end on that because I want people for whom it applies to, to really think about that, right? Whether you, you are going, whether you want to be, yeah, a recipient of that kind of protection and whether, or whether you want to kind of be disobedient, whether you want to kind of break with th that afforded protection in order to stand with, um, to stand with and alleviate um, other people's suffering, right? Um, because that's, I think, our task and our, our project as feminists and people who are kind of imagining liberated futures. Thank you. Angelica, do you want to share anything? Really quickly. Thank you so much, Kelsey, Chelsea, Lola, Zara, Kate. No, no more exclusions, everyone who attended today. This has been such, um, what's the word? An energizing, um, inspiring, inspiring is a weird word, but an energizing conversation. And I think that is what abolition provides. It provides hope. Um, I think, like Zara said, like reform isn't going to cut in. Like it's been how many years since Trayvon Martin died? We can't be saying the same things, making the same demands. Reform clearly isn't going to cut it. This isn't something that's new. It's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And abolition provides an alternative way of thinking about the way that we structure the world, um, an alternative program. And it's it encourages us to think beyond the limits of what's already here. So often when you, I say, okay, we should get rid of the police, but people are like, but what, what would we put in there instead? We get to decide, like it, it's forcing us to really think beyond the limits of our imaginations. What we've been told has to be beyond the status quo, which I think can be very scary for some people, but it's also liberating um, and yeah, like someone said in the comments, it, it allows us to be creative, build something new. I'm literally just reading the comments now. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, yeah, everyone drop your socials. Let's all continue the conversation um, on Instagram, Twitter. I hope like Cape and Enemy will be doing more of these. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Kay and Kate, y'all are dope. Thank you so much everyone for coming. You've all been just like absolutely incredible. I'll just quickly direct some people to some organizations in the UK. Um, <clears throat> if you wanna give us money or like share all of our stuff, like I said, that petition is on the Cape website um, and it's been shared on all of our socials as well. Um, I think the website is cape-campaign.org. Um, and uh, yeah, if, like we need to stop these prisons being built. Um, I saw there was a shout out about the Glasgow prison that one of the women's prisons I think is not being built, which would be amazing. Um, well done to the protesters there. Um, but yeah, there's Cape, um, there's no more exclusions. Um, there's Bent Bars who support um, queer people in prison um, and are a letter writing scheme. Like this is a huge thing. It's like 
making sure that people in prison like have people to write to and have community and aren't cut off that is one of the biggest like abolitionist feminist practice practices there is is to keep connected and make sure people are not forgotten when they are inside um there is something called the parolee support network where i really encourage if there's lawyers who are um uh on this call who um you know, if you're thinking about if you're working with people and trying to get them out of prison, we are also working with a lawyer to create a network. Um, basically, anyone who has access to housing, um, therapy, any kind of support, any kind of resources, trying to build as strong a case as possible when someone is coming up to their um, like an appeal um, or. Um, Oh, I'm blanking on the words, but yeah, but when someone is coming up for put, put the, the possibility of release, um, to build a stronger case to show that the community will support them, that really helps particularly IPP prisoners. Um, and so if you can get in touch with CAPE about the parolee support network for any kind of support that you could provide to make someone's life easier, whether that was that you could go for a coffee once all of this is all over with COVID, or you could do Zoom chats or help get someone a phone or any of these kinds of things to help that transi transition coming out of prison easier, that, that would be really helpful. Um, Cradle Community, we have a GoFundMe and all of that money is going towards supporting um, people in prison and people organizing for abolition. Um, and so definitely if you can give some money towards that. Um, there is the Prisoner Solidarity Network and their crowdfunder and the BLM UK fund is up now as well. I really recommend everyone goes to check those out and uh, distribute as you can. Um, and in terms of moving forwards, yeah, we will, if there's interest, we will do more of these. There's there's people who couldn't make it onto this call um, that I really wanted to talk to about disability justice and about indigenous struggles and um, about these other different uh, aspects of abolition. And so we can do more if that's what people want. Um, and uh, yeah. Basically, your abolition is, like Lola said, it's within the home, it's within yourself, and it's also within your workplace right now. People are having conversations about policing, and uh, your organization is reassessing its stance on the police. Bring us in to do an Abolition 101 workshop where we can start to question what those processes are. That includes if you work in a, in a mental health service or any of these other kinds of public services or for charities. Bring us in, get abolitionists in, start having these conversations and really, really get people to question before they engage with those kinds of institutions. What else can we do to keep us safe? Because as we've heard today, this is really at the core of this, this is about safety, right? And that is the narrative that's pushed on us as to why we need police in prisons. It's supposedly for our safety. We know that that's not true. And our fear around abolishing these institutions is often also around our safety. And so really, who keeps us safe? You know, as they say, it's we, we keep us safe. And that is all we have. That's all we've ever had. And so I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for your time and your insight and your energy. And you are all incredible. Thank you.